You are listening to Keystone's Stock Talk Show, episode 245. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at www.keystocks.com. Come back often, and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Keystocks and on Facebook, and keep submitting your stocks via the usual social channels or at our website, keystocks.com for our Your Stock Our Take segment, and we just might review your stock in an upcoming show and let you know if it is a buy, sell, or hold. It's great to be back again this week. We kick off the show with a look at last week's poll, and Brett will delve into thematic investing, essentially a top-down approach which looks at ta- it takes into account large macro driven qualities, whether it's GDP, interest rates, sector specifics, or in this case, specific trends. I hit the viewer mailbag to start and answer a question on Texas Inc., symbol TCS on the TSX, which provides slot supply chain solutions to the healthcare and complex distribution verticals. The viewer points out uh, the long-term revenue growth in this business, but it lacks share price movement over the past three years and asks if there's an opportunity here potentially. Aaron answers a viewer question on BQE Water Inc., symbol BQE on the TSX Venture, a water treatment company specializing in providing innovative wastewater treatment solutions to the global mining industry. A microcap that is profitable and has a five-year strong share price performance track record. The viewer asks if it can continue. Last and certainly least, Brennan put together an investment profile on Bill Ackman, the American billionaire hedge fund manager, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Perishing Square Capital Management, a hedge fund company. Brennan lets you know his particular investment style and whether or not we agree with it. And Brennan will be soon leaving to go to Perishing Square Capital. I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you think so? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. No, I will not be. I'll be sticking uh, around with the boys at Keystone. Yeah, uh, get better than this. All right, let's get to the show. I'm going to welcome my co-host, Mr. Aaron Dunn, and the Killer Bees, Brett and Brennan. How are you guys doing? Good, <laughs> we good, got good. That out. Doing good. Doing well. Oh, it's getting left in. Yeah, I think we yeah. need to leave it in. Yeah. So uh, w- let's get to the poll question quickly. Uh, we had a poll question last week. Brett knows it. Brennan doesn't, so Brett's going to explain it to Brennan right now. I think Brennan actually voted in this one, didn't you? Oh, what well, does it mean? He still did, or he, he looked at it. I know. I don't know if you voted. Yeah, I haven't. I didn't vote in this one, but I did. He didn't rig the vote. One. He didn't rig the vote this time. So nice. uh, I, I asked this week because they don't even know this exists most of the time. This is the first they're hearing about it. Is what investing theme are you the most bullish about? So AI, of course, led the field at fifty-seven percent of your votes followed by blockchain at 17%, then electrification at 14%, and space exploration at 11%. What did Brennan vote? That's what I want to know. I didn't I didn't vote anything, but I did oh. end up there was someone who commented none of the above and then I used our Keystone account and I was like, "Well, let us know, you know, what are what are what you're most bullish about in, in the comments, you know, let us know." And you know, he gives a good he he gives a good answer here. He says, "You know, we should probably pull this up, but he says you know, I'm not interested in chasing any themes. Uh, does no one else remember the dot com bubble? He says, as you guys preach, preach, let's find profitable companies with increasing revenues and free cash flow and hopefully stable, decreasing share counts at reasonable low multiples. You know, if I was going to pick one of the four options provided, it would be electrification and renewables as the sector is tangible and can be valued objectively. Um you know, but either way, I think that he gave a pretty good response. Great comments there. Yeah, we liked you know that was actually I mean, Ryan, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's I'll my burner send him account. A message yeah. and make sure it isn't. It's true. Uh, <laughs> I, I you know what? You know what? He, he, he's you know commented what? on a few times, so he, he's not Ryan. Ryan wouldn't put that much work into it. That's <laughs> true. That's true. You know, you know what? What Ryan's wasn't on there is insults at Brandon. <laughs> yeah, it's true. 
Gold wasn't on there. Gold hit a new sure. all-time high today. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. Uh, no, nobody seems to be paying attention to that. So, I mean, there may be an opportunity there. I'll probably not in individual gold producers because you know if it reverses, they 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 take a kicking in a year. But there is some companies out there that uh, we follow that kind of uh, you know loosely are associated with the sector that uh, look to provide some value over the course of this year uh, as gold uh, touches an all time high. Right now, I'm looking at it. To two thousand one hundred and twenty six seventy, yep. up thirty one dollars today as we as we speak. Well, the, rea- All the right, reality so- of it is that gold stocks actually don't follow the commodity price, the the price of gold very well. So if you look at the price of gold relative to, like, say the the um, global mining or the gold index, um, which are which are gold stocks, large cap gold producing companies. Um, you know, the, I don't have the exact numbers. I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's about an overperformance of two times or more for the, for the price of gold relative to gold stocks. And then of course, like if you look at the mid tier companies or the small exploration companies, I would say it's even worse for gold stocks. Yeah. And you're, didn't, you're going to talk about commodity investing a little bit in our upcoming webinars that we're announcing yeah, one and just things. show I, the I, long-term performance versus some other, uh, yeah, sectors. I talked about it somewhat at the world outlook conference. And what I want to do is expand upon that yeah. at our, at our DIY seminars, um, and just really kind of drill into it and just in terms of, you know, the, the theme is really how do commodities, how should they fit into your portfolio? Um, because you know, people that are bullish, on commodities. I mean, there's always a super cycle happening in their, in their world or about to happen, but, um, what, like, what has it actually looked like for people over time, right? Relative to what we consider value generating profitable stocks. So that, that's something that we would talk about, but, you know, I did a lot of comparisons or several comparisons of the world outlook. So we'll do that again at the DIY conference and then we'll, we'll dive into it a little deeper. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Well, We've got to give away one of these mugs, don't we? We do. It's true. And and we picked a, a question uh, that we think is quite relevant right now. One of these mugs, I'll show them. Uh, for those of you listening to this on the podcast, I'm holding up one of our mugs right now. Hopefully you can see that. Excellent. Not if you're listening to it, but if you're viewing it on uh, YouTube right now on our YouTube channel. Now, uh, the company, the question came on a company that we will actually be interviewing in a couple of weeks uh, in LA at the Roth conference. The company is called Perion. The ticker symbol is P-E-R-I. We have to say we had hundreds of, uh, of, of your stock our takes come in. So it's great to see everybody really does want these mugs clearly, which is awesome. Uh, but uh, this is about, I'll read the question out completely. Curious to hear your take on this small cap tech stock. Despite pretty consistent growth, it trades at a PE of 10 and momentum is ugly. What am I missing on this one? Thanks. So uh, it's good. the mug will be coming your way. Noel, we won't say your last name, but uh, thanks for the question. We are going to sit down with the management team. That's what we thought it kind of apropos to give you the win on this one. We'll be sitting down with them uh, in 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 a couple of weeks time or less than a couple of weeks time in LA. And then we will answer the question uh, on the following show the week after that. So that would be probably the week after the 20th when we get back and we'll answer that, but we'll send you out the coveted mug. Keep your questions coming in uh, and we'll, uh, we'll give away one a month at least uh, for those. So keep those questions coming in. All right, we're going to move to Brett's segment here. You're going to look at thematic investing. And this came from a, uh, a, a kind of a, a visual capitalist. Uh, what do we call that? A Infographic, <laughs> I guess. Infographic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you've got the word. It's, it's a great inf- infographic. It goes through thematic investing since 1950. So you're going to go through it right now and uh, tell us what thematic investing is. Yeah, this really uh, entwined with the poll we did as well. So it all works together. And really, we're going to go through some of the historic themes and the benefits and the issues of thematic investing. And then I'm sure these guys will have something to say about it. But just looking at this graph has a really idea of some of the historic thematic investments. Some which people might be more familiar with is the Japanese investment trend in the 1980s where everyone would just want to get into the Japanese market. So you saw lots of people going into it. You saw the currency as well appreciate during that time. And then 
bit more recently, we saw the FANG companies over the past decade, of course, as those all exploded. And then you saw in the late 90s, early 2000s, the NASDAQ index explode as well. Some that you might have not be familiar with because it was even before Aaron's time, maybe not before Aaron's time, but at least before Ryan's, the European stocks in the 1950s where they exploded after the really the whole idea behind it was the rebuilding after World War II and investors really wanting to invest in that market. So what is thematic investing? Thematic investing is a top-down approach, which means taking into account large macro-driven qualities, whether it's GDP, interest rates, or sector specifics, or in this case, a specific trend. Really the difference between just a standard sector or industry investment compared to thematic investment, is thematic investment normally has a story around it. So like I was saying with the post-World War II rebuilding of Europe, that is really what the thematic investment, you have some sort of a tangible story to build that theme. As well, another example more recently that wouldn't be on that chart is in the late 2010s, the legalization of marijuana, where investors just piled into cannabis to do with that legalization. And we're seeing a bit of that actually again now that is progressing in the US, but we saw 2016, 2017, especially in Canada, where investors were just dumping money into it. And as it is a story, you'll generally just see news stories covering it within the investing community first normally, and then you'll start to see it outside the investor community. But it can go the other way around where it's a more generalized topic and then investors jump in after the fact. You really know it's an investing theme once your taxi driver is asking you about it or someone who's not normally uh, it, giving you investment advice or asking for it. That's when you know it is a prevalent theme. And of course, as themes permeate investors and the general public's uh, thoughts, uh, this investment method is similar to momentum investing in many aspects where price appreciation leads to more price appreciation. And of course, on the flip side, price depreciation leads to more price depreciation. Then this would, of course, create a high volatility investment strategy. So why would someone invest thematically? The biggest reason is it's just an easy way to invest. You have an idea whether it be Japan is going to be strong in the future or let's say your AI investment that is going to be the theme of the next decade is you're done and really researching at that point for many people. You have your investment thesis. You can go from there and just work on your investment, uh, how exactly you're going to invest. And in this case, it's generally through ETFs or funds, but more recently, of course, ETFs compared to what we would do, which is a fundamental bottom up approach, which is effectively on the polar end, polar opposite end of a thematic investment is we comb through individual company filings which obviously, since you're going one by one companies, you hit a lot of dead ends and a lot of really, you're, you're looking through the individual filings and it's a lot more individual, small detail work versus the broad picture. So like I was saying, most of the time you're investing through an ETF these days, but you might be doing a mutual fund to do a thematic investment. But we're going to focus generally on ETFs because they seem to be the predominant method of investing thematically these days. They're generally liquid. And you can generally look at the bid and ask spread to give you an idea of how liquid an individual ETF actually is. For retail investors, ETFs are generally liquid enough to manage quick inflows and quick outflows of capital, which is why people like them. And of course, though the larger the capital you want to invest, the more slippage that would occur, especially on the very small idea ETFs, which might only have a hundred million under investment. And as you are investing in uh, sorry, you are investing in a trend and the brokers would like to say in asset managers, I'm going to go into why this might not be the case is they will say it provides diversification benefits to a broader portfolio. But like I said, I'll give an idea of why that isn't always the case in a couple minutes. So really, what are the issues? Why is am I being critical of it in many cases? Well, first of all, your idea may just not be able to be invested in. What I mean by this is there's not always a public company or a public investment vehicle that you can actually use to invest in it. So let's say you're using an ETF or a mutual funds. They may be limited by size. They may be limited to what they can invest in. So they might not be a public company. So those ETFs can't actually invest in it. They can't invest in public private equity, which obviously you as a retail investor may not do 
able to either, but that would make it so your investment thesis is just not investable. As well, ETFs are, if it's a larger ETF, let's say a billion dollar fund, and you wanted to invest in a small cap company or the ETF wanted to, they, they decide, oh, it fits the theme perfectly. We want to invest in this. Let's say it's a $20 million company. So a com- a, an ETF might be able to invest, and this would probably be on the higher end, a million dollars into that company. But the, even though they're only 5% of that company at that point, it would only be 0.1% of their total portfolio. So even if that company did great, it really wouldn't affect the portfolio, even at a 100% return, that's 0.1% of a total portfolio return. So obviously, as the fund grows, it can actually eliminate some investment ideas, especially in newer ideas in a newer thematic fund. It might just eliminate you being able to invest in it through an ETF, and then you would have to go through individual companies, which even then, it might not align with why you're investing in that theme. As well, since most people are using funds, it's top down. And this is why I'm really focused on funds is that you you normally use funds when you're doing top down investing is you will have management fees, of course, which they will create a drag. And if your specific theme may be smaller, might have a smaller investment theme. It will likely mean since it's a smaller theme, they have less assets under management, which means they have to make up for their fees with a higher asset under management fee. So instead of, let's say, a 0.4% investment fee under management fee, MER, it might be 1% or even upwards of 2%, which just creates a massive drag on any potential returns. And the next point that is an issue with thematic investment is it relies on momentum. Most people will focus on the upside when a new theme appears, but this relies on more people accepting the idea and more people implementing it in their investment thesis. So that is really at its core, a momentum investing idea. As a result of this momentum, you can end up with absurd valuations with analysts of these companies moving away from, they'll first go from price to cash flow to PE to adjusted EBITDA, then to price to sales. And then they'll even do stuff like page views, which you saw during the dot-com bubble, when you just stray farther and farther away to support these valuations. And that is an issue with thematic investing is it you'll have the asset managers or researchers, they'll stray farther away from the fundamentals to support these valuations as it has to keep on growing. Last but certainly not least, these funds are not as diversifying as the various asset managers running these thematic investing want you to think. You really generally have them saying two points of benefits of diversification internally within a fund and in the context of your overall portfolio. So first, within the fund, some asset managers like to say they're diversified as they invest in dozens or hundreds of securities within their fund. But the issue with them saying that within a thematic fund is because it's a theme, they will inherently be highly correlated, meaning that they have those risks. Yes, they, they might get rid of a few of the idiosyncratic risk to an individual company, but they're increasing the risk of their correlation between the company just due to the nature of this type of fund. So simply put, really, a thematic fund is meant to create a concentrated position to expose yourself to a specific theme, which is inherently not diversified. You might get a couple less idiosyncratic risks, but then you're also losing the upside too as well, which I'm, these guys have talked to about many times. As well, second, the point to it is diversifying your overall portfolio. Your portfolio may see some diversification benefits, but this heavily de- depends on what theme you're investing in as well as what you are holding. So let's say going back to the 1980s with Japanese stocks, if I were to invest that as a Canadian, I would have likely seen quite a bit of diversification benefits, ge- geographic diversification benefits in this case. But then let's say if you're investing in the NASDAQ as an American in the 1990s, it'd be less defi- diversifying in compared to it as you'd have a higher correlation. And then because it's high momentum, you'd have a higher beta compared to the general US stock market. In other words, it creates risk. My point is, even though fund managers will tote the diversification benefits from investing in these specific thematic ETFs, which they hold a large amount of stocks or securities, it's not exactly cut and dry. And in reality, some cases might actually increase risk, even though your point of diversifying is to decrease risk. So lastly, after critiquing it for about the last five minutes, how can you actually incorporate thematic investing in your portfolio? I would go through a couple methods. Uh, methods or say a couple methods that would be better than just a blanket approach to thematic investing as a hybrid approach. So this is really combining your top-down approach, which 
thematic investing normally is with a bottom up approach, which is similar to what we do or what we do in the most in most cases. So you identify a theme, let's say it's AI, you go through all the AI companies and find which ones actually trade at a decent valuation, which ones are actually a good company and not just purely momentum hype when they're trading at 100 times sales or something like that. Why would you want to own that in your portfolio, which many of these ETFs will invest into it? They say, oh, it has AI in its name. Well, that's the checkbox and it's in the ETF now. You now invest in a bad company, even if it is 2 or 3% of that ETF, you now own part of that and it will eliminate your gains of the better companies. Second, looking past internally within a theme, you can look at adjacent industries and companies for what will really benefit from the theme as well. This can allow for the upside of the trend and it lowers some of the downside risk because if your adjacent company or industry is only tangentially related, they'll benefit from the underside, but then they still have something backing it if that theme falls apart. As well, these companies do tend to seem to be priced better as the pure thematic investors will just overlook them. So you get less of that momentum investing and more fundamental investing. And that's where I'm going to wrap up my monologue here is I know Ryan has a company in his mind thinking about what in Jason investing it is. And it's one we've covered quite a few times, but I'll let him go through that. Yeah, I think you're anticipating what I'm going to say here. Um, if you look at, I mean, often... What leads us to a theme, though, is really just looking at every company in Canada by the numbers, the revenue growth and the cash flow that leads you to themes um, that led us to Hammond Power over time. It, it It is an adjacent way to play the electrification theme, um, but the numbers were there. The growth was there. The low price relative to those underlying numbers were there, and it became a low lower risk way of playing an electrification theme, even if electrification didn't move forward, you were buying a business that, uh, you know, serviced other industries that had nothing to do with electrification. They build transformers for the oil and gas industry, for instance. And, you know, before electrification was a theme, uh, you know, they were still making good money. So if you could find something trading at a reasonable price that can benefit significantly from a powerful theme, then you've got, you're limiting your downside and you have the upside that um, that you're looking for when you get a theme right. So I think that is a great way to to play uh, a potential theme because you yeah. never know for certain whether you are you know going to get behind that theme. But if you have it backed up by a company that's already going to do well or at least reasonably well, and then if it hits the tailwind of that theme, you can really have a winner. And obviously, you know you can see that's what's gone on with having power. You know, push back on me if you guys want, but you know, generally, I mean, I know you guys will, but generally, like photon control was, you know, kind of a, a play, like a similar kind of thematic play on the semis, but yet they were selling, you know, sensors to the semi manufacturers. That's correct. I mean, I know that it's. Yeah, if you were positive yeah. on semiconductors in any given period of time, uh, there was a lagging effect. So you're able to buy them you know, ahead of that, but yeah, it was definitely a way to play that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then you, if you talk about thematic investing, um, it, I always, you know, the limitation of it is everybody's looking to find the greatest theme of this decade or the next decade. Uh, the past decade, as we know, we've talked about this in the past, the best performing stock on the entire Toronto ex stock exchange was Boyd. So they own auto body repair shops. Nobody was predicting auto body repair shops or a consolidation of them to be the best theme in the past decade. But the company that executed on this best, which I would say is Boyd, produced the return that you, you know, the best return that you could have achieved in the market on the Toronto Stock Exchange over that 10 year period. So no theme would have helped you there. But, you know, the numbers help you there. So limiting yourself just to theme investing, it can be part of the equation. But limiting yourself just to that is probably not doing justice to an overall portfolio as well. Um, like we said, if you nail a theme with a good company, it can really provide tailwinds. But uh, I wouldn't just go with thematic investing over time because if you get it wrong, you can really get it wrong and it can it can go south in your portfolio. Yeah, just on that last point is uh, I highlighted Japan quite a few times because it peaked out. And then I think it was 1979. I'll get the correct update up there. And it just passed after whatever thir 30 years, or I guess it'd be 1989, wouldn't it be? Yeah. 
um, after 30 years, 35 years, it just passed all time high set then. So if you were holding that entire, and that's not inflation adjusted, that's just the index. So you had to wait 35 years to even hit parity if you invested at that time. Yeah. And there's other themes, like they're not decade long themes, but themes that, you know, could have promised to be that like, like cannabis was a tremendous, you know, everybody in Canada wanted to invest in it. 3d printing. I remember for a couple of years and, you know, stocks in that sector went way up and then just went off a cliff. So, you know, if you are positioning 30, 40, 50% of your portfolio behind what you believe is the next greatest theme, um, you know, you, you, you're subject to high yeah. degree of volatility and you can really, you know, slaughter your own portfolio doing it that way, to, to be frank. So, you know, buying the good companies, if they happen to get powered by a theme and it powers them higher than you ever thought they could, great. But make sure you have a good business, good balance sheet, all those things we always stress behind the company that you are looking at to invest in in a theme and, one last you know, one when airlines. we invest in ai we do that as well we buy companies with good balance sheets right now good cash flow and aaron talks about that all the time yeah i was just gonna say like so hopefully you know, he doesn't know one last one that like peter lynch and warren <laughs> buffett talk about like airlines you know everybody thought oh wow like airlines air travel this is the new thing well it just so happens that you know airlines are kind of poor businesses or they're it, it they're very logistically tough businesses, you know, in general. So razor thin margins. It's exactly. crazy you how know, little so they while make everybody on a in the flight, world was crazy. thinking, you know, airlines are going to be the next best thing. This is the next best theme. Well, it didn't end up happening that uh, that way. Um, and I know one story of Warren Buffett ended up, I'm pretty sure it was Warren. He ended up, or maybe it was Peter Lynch. I am getting them mixed up, but they ended up buying the an airline because they thought, you know, let's invest in this theme. Well, and the stock ended up performing well only because of the v outbreak of the Vietnam war, war, because this airline was, you know, shipping back and forth. If that the war didn't take place, um, you know, he stated himself, it probably wouldn't have uh, worked out for him. Anyways, let's move on. All right. Well, I think we've done that topic justice. Let's move on. I'm going to hit the mailbag here. Awesome. I'm going to look at Texas Inc., Symbol TCS on the TSX venture, or sorry, on the TSX, trades at around 38.25. Market cap is 562 million. Pays a really small yield under 1%, 0.82 right now. But they are based in Montreal, Quebec. The company provides supply chain solutions to the healthcare and complex distribution verticals. The company's software covers warehouse distribution, transportation management, supply management, at point of use, distributed order management, along with financial management and analytics. They primarily sell the solution on a SaaS basis, and they have a thousand customers in over 15 countries. We can see here there's a strong uh, track record of revenue and gross profit growth. Both of them look solid from in terms of revenue from about 45.1 million in 2014 to about 168 and a half million over the past 12 months. However, cash flow from operations has not been as strong. While the company continually produces positive cash flow, it is lumpy from year to year, and there is not a significant growth trend over the past 10 years. Profitability is similar to this. Let's look at their last quarter, which would be Q3 2023. These are the highlights. Revenue that would be excluding hardware revenue was about 36.2 million up 11%. Um, while total revenue was up 13%, including that hardware revenue to about 43.8 gross margins were up slightly to 45% from 44%. Net profit, however, was five cents per share uh, down from six cents in the same period last year. And adjusted EBITDA was 2.6 million compared to 2.8 in Q3 of last year. I'm going to provide some additional notes here. Texas, we've covered it for years. We don't recommend it at present, but it has a great balance sheet. It always shows up in our cash rich report, 32.2 million and uh, roughly no debt. The SaaS revenue here increased significantly in that last period, which is of note and good to see up 48% to 14.2 million. It benefited from about a 3% FX tailwind and there was a revenue recognition of about 700,000 related to the, co the completion of a product performance obligation. Uh, there was annual recurring revenue up 16% in the quarter to 87.2 million. Uh, note here though, SaaS subscription bookings measured uh, by ARR uh, decreased by 17% to 
5.9 million in the quarter up from four or down from 5.8 million in the third quarter of the previous fiscal year. So let's look at the valuations here. They are at a premium. EV to revenue based on uh, fiscal 2024 expected is 3.1. EV to EBITDA uh, based again on that 2024 estimate is about 53.8. Uh, EV to EBITDA trailing is 65.95. And the PE here, because you know based on forward of about nine, 13 cents in terms of what the estimate is and earnings is about you know, just under 300. So you can see there, premium valuations. A conclusion here before I lose my voice completely. Uh, alongside the quarter, Texas announced uh, a February restructuring, which would reduce its workforce by about 4%, equates to about $4.6 million in annual savings. It'll book a severance charge in Q Q4 of about $2.3 million. Potentially, this will uh, uh, allow the company to be more profitable going forward. The company appears well positioned, we'd say, for a long term revenue growth as it capitalizes on its leading end to end healthcare products. There should be operating leverage as the SAS, SAS MISX increases and SAS margins grow and investments moderate relative to growth, but this will take time. It's a good company. The valuations are high at present, and for me, they limit the upside. It is priced to perfection to a degree and based on those forward numbers. When asked on the company at any time over the past three years, we have answered with the same take. It's a good business, good balance sheet. The SaaS part of the business is becoming more significant, which is good. But the price we are being asked to pay is too rich. It's not a surprise to me that over the past three years, the stock has been basically flat. We continue to monitor at present. Now, the software space in Canada, just as a note here, is limited. And we would potentially like to own a name like Texas, but not at any price, particularly when the stock trades, like I said, at over 50 times forward EV to EBITDA. We were able to buy a Canadian software and recommend this to clients, small cap with a higher growth profile at 10 to 11 times forward free cash flow this past November. On a comparative basis, it was far superior value. Now that stock is up 89%. Since we recommended it, we're happy to have recommended that business over Texas. Now, Texas has done reasonably well since November, but not nearly uh, 89%. All right. That's good. And we, we've we been following, I'll just say, we've been following Texas for, for several years, and it's always had that challenge yep. that the margin, <laughs> the bottom line profit margin, they just never seem to be able to generate much in terms of earnings. Um, no. which is which is the major issue. And sometimes, you know, you could be looking at a company maybe in the software space where they're really just starting to ramp up profitability. So the valuation will be high, but there's that there's that potential for at least a, a period of exponential growth as they bring that bottom line <clears throat> margin up to a reasonable rate. But with Texas, I mean, it's been years that we've seen this. Yeah. Um, I don't think that there's any, you know, reasonable expectation right now that we're going to see the margin come up substantially. I mean, the, the company would really have to, you know, five, six times its share price to, or its its earnings per share to really. Uh, yes. I think that's yeah. where we're at. And, and, and you know, it, potentially it's a takeover target at some point, but e even now it would have to be, you know, bought by a firm that really saw a large growth uh, runway ahead of them because it, the, the valuations are high. Again, as the SaaS becomes more of a component, and we did see good growth in that in the quarter, it should have operating leverage. We should see higher margins going forward. But again, that could be two, three years down the road. And it seems to always be two, three years down the road that you're anticipating. And it's still trading at, you know, 30 to 50 times EV to EBITDA, which, you know, it's not growing at 50% every year, right? Like the, the revenue growth was, you know, 10 to 15% that we're looking at potentially over the next year. Um, so for that level of growth, it is a premium multiple that you're seeing. Um, there's just not a lot of selection in the Canadian sect, uh, software sector. So potentially there's a people crowding into a name like this, that again, a quality business, there is growth over time and the valuation has been bid up. Although of course, in the U S you see many software companies with high valuations. So when we do find one, as we did this November that, you know, has good free cash flow and you can buy it about 10 to 11 times versus like the multiples that you're seeing on Texas. Uh, we jumped on that at the time. We didn't expect it to go up 90% in three and a half, four months. 
uh, but it's done that. And uh, we're happy that we, you know, bought that company, which again, had a higher growth profile, um, had the similar type of cash balance in the bank, just a little less, but net, no, no debt as well. And, uh, uh, again, traded it just far superior valuations. And, uh, those are the companies that we like to buy. All right. I think we're going to move on to, uh, Aaron's going to look at, uh, BQE water. Yeah, interesting it's a, company. We, we yeah. received, uh, an, an email question about this company all the way out from Germany. So always nice to see. Well, it's good uh, to see that we have listeners out in Germany. We, we, we always we're, knew we're international. Now we appear, uh, appeal hugely to the German market. We've, we've been told, but, uh, now it's been confirmed. Somehow. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's get into this. Uh, BQE water, happy to do a, uh, intro analysis on this company. Um, so what do they do? They're a water treatment company. They specialize in wastewater treatment solutions for the global mining industry. So essentially they, they make mining environmentally responsible and socially acceptable. Uh, the company trades on the TSX venture exchange. The symbol is BQE $33 per share. Uh, this is a micro cap at a $42 million market capitalization and almost no shares outstanding. I mean, very low float, 1.2 million shares. So uh, minimal trading, and we'll kind of get to that uh, a little bit later, but this is what the stock price looks like over the last 12 months. You know, fair bit of volatility as one would expect for a thinly traded company. Now we can go back in history on this stock all the way back to about 2001. Um, and we can see that this stock certainly does have a history. At one point, it appears that it was up around $400. I'd, I'd have to look into what the journey has been for this company. Um, that's a little outside of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at some of the recent financials and just where the company sees itself going forward. So let's take a look at Q3 2023, uh, the last quarter that was released. So really strong quarter. Um, revenue $6.2 million, up 78%. Income from operations of 193%. They had a nice uh, increase in operating margins, 36.3% compared to 22%. And then uh, almost um, $1.67 in earnings per share for the quarter, up from 45 cents. So huge growth. And uh, good numbers for the nine month period as well um, 13 million in revenue, up 51%, 60% growth in operating income from operations about almost 70% growth in earnings per share to $1.88 um, and then about 120 basis point margin increase. So one thing that does stand out here is they seem to have made almost all of their earnings for the nine month period just in the third quarter. So $1.88 in earnings per share for the nine months, a Q3 earnings per share of $1.67. So, uh, you know, minimal of what's that, about 21 cents in earnings made in the first uh, first two quarters of the year. So in terms of the management commentary for the quarter, uh, they say that the strong performance was driven by a strategic focus on rebalancing the revenue sources from sales of recovered metals to fees from recurring water treatment. So recurring revenue, this is where the company sees itself going in the future. For the first nine months of the year, they extended their water treatment services to four different sites in North America, and they grew the year-to-date uh, revenues in that segment 94% to 5.4 million. So again, this is the recurring revenue portion of the business. They also say that the technical services revenue has been a forerunner to future operations. So it really, uh, it, it really sets the stage for growth in other segments of the business. Uh, technical services revenue up 31%. Um, and then they also mentioned the fourth quarter that the operating season in Canada essentially shuts down due to the winter weather conditions well in the US, it, it continues year round. So it sounds like we'd be expecting some seasonality from this company. And then when we break the company's revenues down, um, we can see here sale of recovered metals from operations. Um, this was 22% of the total revenue of the business in Q3 2023, compared to almost 40% in Q3 2022. Wastewater fee and operations. So this is what the company is saying are the recurring revenues, 40% uh, of revenue in, in 2023 for the third quarter compared to 34% and then technical services revenue um, also up quite a bit. So really what we're seeing here uh, is 
presumably a transition from being, you know, a more contract based business to a company that generates recurring revenues and recurring revenues are really a very powerful way to make money in the market because it just gives the company better visibility and investors better visibility in terms of what, um, what revenues are going to be in the future. If you're really contract based business or you're doing one off sales, you know, you can make some sales in a quarter, but you don't necessarily know that they're going to repeat. But if you have recurring revenues, um, as you're adding new business, as you're adding new customers, you're really adding that revenue on top of your existing revenue, ass assuming that it's sticky and you can keep those customers. So we'd love to see the recurring revenue model. Um, you know, it does seem from my understanding, the technical services revenue is not recurring in nature. That's more contract based or, you know, short term in nature, but um, you know, certainly we're seeing a lot of growth there. And then that perhaps leads to more of the, the water treatment um, revenue, which is recurring. So uh, interesting, uh, interesting breakdown there um, as well. The balance sheet, very strong balance sheet, about 6.5 million in cash, very little debt, 1.7 million. So that's net cash, about 4.8 million, a little over 10% of the company's market cap. Great to see the company has a good solid foundation that it's able to build off of. Um, now, if I look at the cash flow, cash flow is interesting here. So for the nine months, they reported earnings of 2.4 million, um, but negative operating cash flow. Um, and this is due to changes in non-cash working capital. So this, this would be things like um, increases in inventory, potentially uh, increases in accounts receivable. receivable. Um, now, another thing that I do notice as well, though, is that in the investing activity section, they do receive dividends from joint ventures. So that's 1.3 million uh, for the nine months of 2023 and then 2.9 million almost for the same period last year. So when we when we add this back in um, to the cash flow, we we do get a positive cash flow number, about 800,000, still well below what they're reporting for earnings. So this can happen sometimes when a company has to invest a lot in future growth. So for example, if they're bringing on a lot of new business, this may mean that they need to hold more inventory, increase their inventories. Uh, it may mean that they need to um, increase their accounts receivable temporarily as well. So it is something that is not necessarily a major red flag, but it's definitely one thing that we would want to pay close attention to. Um, when you're doing an analysis of a company, you're looking at the earnings, you want to you want to know that those are quality earnings, that they're converting to cash flow. The best way to do that is to look at the cash flow statement. Uh, are, are the earnings actually converting into operating cash flow? So uh, here we're seeing, you know, not great numbers on that side, but you know, this is just one period. It's something that we would we would continue to monitor. Uh, and then just finally, valuation here. If I were to just look at the trailing twelve months, there's no analyst coverage or, or not wide analyst coverage anyway. So I'm not going to take any any analyst estimates. But about a dollar sixty nine in earnings over the last twelve months. That puts, puts the company about 20 times, you know, certainly not too bad if they're going to continue to grow. And as well, they have that, that cash rich balance sheet. Um, but one of the things that I will mention here is that this company barely trades because it has such a, a small share float, 1.2 million shares. So I think that uh, when I was looking at the company today and it only traded um, maybe about uh, 35 shares in the first three or four hours of trading. And I think it only averages about a couple hundred shares per day. So very low liquidity for anybody who's interested. You know, this is really a story where I've seen enough that I would, you know, be interested in maybe talking to management, learning a little bit more about the company, um, a little bit more about their technology and, and just what some of the competitors look like, what these recurring revenues look like. Are these under contract? Are they long term contract? How easy is it for customers to cancel? Um, but it's it's interesting just on a, on a really basic cursory analysis, um, certainly something that could be dug deeper into. I would say that the low trading liquidity, it would be a concern, um, certainly for, for any type of a recommendation, because we wouldn't want to move the share price. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting company and there's a good track record of revenue growth and, you know, it's becoming more profitable, uh, right now it looks like, which is nice to see. I think probably at 20 times, it's probably near term fairly value, but if it continues to grow, you know, it, it, it could be an interesting company. The balance sheet looks good. Uh, but at, you know, what, 
we would not be able to recommend it to our client base. I mean, like I said, th- I think you said 35, Sarah's. I think I see 33 right now. So oh, okay. yeah, so it's, it's about, this, yeah, yeah you missed it by two. Ago, so I thought maybe they would have gotten up to 40 shares <laughs> yeah. traded today, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, but so, so it's a, it's a really low, uh, low volume stock. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it, it's certainly interesting. And, you know, if, if it was an individual investor and, you know, you could see that more recurring revenue base going forward and continue of the growth with a good balance sheet, you know, it could be an individual might want to look at this. Uh, certainly couldn't have, you know, thousands of people buying into the share price at any given time. Um, that would uh, move the stock too much at any given point. But it's probably, you know, just based on a cursory overview, we'd really have to talk to them more to do a full overview. It looks fairly valued in the current range right now, but if they continue to grow, it can move higher. Yeah, I'm getting average trading volume of 420 shares a day, so... Yeah. Not a lot of activity. It's a little better, but still 32, 33 is, yeah. is low today. Sorry, Brett. Uh, I was going to comment on the working capital. It's uh, primarily due to an increase in uh, receivables, trade receivables. So something we would ask management is why is that increasing? Is there any bad debt to that? Because if they do start to have late collections, normally it'll be 90 days as they cut off and then they'll start to take write downs, which then will lower their gap earnings. Because that's when you'll start to see a, your increase in receivables actually affect gap earnings where it affects cash flow right away. So you, that'd be something you'd want to watch if you were concerned about an increase in receivables. All right. Perfect. Let's move on to um, Bill to from Yankman. Brennan. Perfect. Okay. He, he's the killer bee with, you know. So yeah, I, I ended up recently watching uh, Bill Ackman on Lex Friedman's podcast and uh, given how similar his investment philosophy is to Keystones and you know how much I just really enjoyed listening to the podcast itself, I thought that I would cover him as an investor spotlight on our own podcast. Uh, so to give you a quick rundown on his life, uh, Bill was born in 1966 uh, in New York and graduated from Harvard in 1988 with a social studies degree. And in 1992, he received a Master of Business Administration. Uh, He is a value investor as well as an activist investor with a uh, strong or with strong influence from Warren Buffett's investment style with a focus on simple, predictable businesses with strong cash flow. And he references Benjamin Graham's intelligent investor uh, as being uh, very formative in his career in teaching him the difference between price versus value. Now, in 1992, Bill founded his first fund, the Gotham Partners, with fellow Harvard graduate David Berkowitz. And uh, after early success in the fund, uh, he ended up shutting it down in 2001 due to some ill-timed bets, lack of diversification, and dangerous concentration in illiquid investments that could not easily be sold uh, when investors wanted their money back from the fund. So this led him to eventually start Pershing Square, Uh, in 2004, which became a top global hedge fund known for its activist investment approach uh, and and substantial annualized returns. Uh, The fund began with approximately 54 million in initial capital and generated a 17.1% annualized return between 2003 and 2021, um, which, uh, or I believe actually, sorry, 2004 to 2021, where the S&P 500 did, I believe, about 10% over that same period, uh, where he now has about $18 billion in assets under management. So since Pershing's uh, inception in 2004, uh, his PSLP fund, so this was the fund that he started right at the beginning, he's now added another fund, uh, but his first fund has returned a cumulative net return of 1,979%, while the S&P's Uh, cumulative return over the same period was 535%. So let's take a look at some of his investing successes, uh, as well as some of his major losses. So number one, this is a success here, is General Growth Properties, Inc. Uh, This was the second largest commercial shopping mall REIT in the United States uh, that was essentially facing difficulties in 2008 due to the global financial crisis. And up until the financial crisis, Bill stated that many people saw malls as being undisruptible. 
you know, looking at that now, how funny that is. Um, but essentially, the, the CFO of General Growth was very aggressive in the way that he borrowed short term money, which led the stock from uh, about $63 per share to $0.34 cents, uh, and led the company to uh, essentially go into bankruptcy. So while General's debt was worrisome, uh, the fundamental drivers of malls are occupancy and net operating income. And from 2008 to 2009, Bill said that these fundamentals were actually improving, which led him to buy about 25% of General Growth's shares. And Bill was able to actually get on the board of General. Uh, they restructured the business and the stock climbed back to $31 per share. Uh, and again, he started buying at about 35 cents. And once General Growth recovered, the company eventually spun off into two new companies, uh, the Howard Hughes Corporation, which still trades today uh, under HHH on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, and that split off in uh, 2010, as well as the Rouse Properties, uh, which split off in 2012, uh, with Pershing still holding about 38% of Howard Hughes Holdings. Now let's move over to uh, CP or Canadian Pacific. So uh, Bill first invested in Canadian Pacific Railway in 2011 when the stock was trading around $69. And his investment thesis was based on CP underperforming Canadian National Railway or CNR on the TSX. Uh, and Bill was very critical in saying that CP was the worst run railway in North America and said management would blame any underperformance on the weather, essentially, which Bill called uh, BS on. So he saw it as a good company, but it was poorly managed, which led him to um, take a 12% stake in 2011. And Bill, at being the activist investment that he is, he tried to get Hunter Harrison, a veteran railway CEO, uh, to meet uh, the board to potentially run the company. But given the board would not meet with Hunter Harrison, this led to a proxy contest and the then current management and board of directors was voted out. Um, and Bill... It was essentially forced to sell his initial investment in 2016 after I believe about a three times gain uh, when he had a run on capital at his fund after a few poor investment decisions uh, were made and you know people were worried so he needed to raise liquidity uh, to basically you know pay people out or give them their money back. Um, but you know, more recently in 2022, Bill actually re-entered into a position in the stock into CP and says that if he uh, actually held onto his original position, if he didn't have to liquidate because of liquidity needs, uh, the position would have actually returned approximately 11 times his initial investment over the time. So there's a couple of his gains. Now let's take a look at at a couple of his stinker investments. Uh, so number one. Uh, in 2012, Bill took a short position on Herbalife, HLF on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, and his short position was valued at about $1 billion. And his thesis was he believed that Herbalife's business model was an illegal pyramid scheme, which would target minority communities who lack business acumen. And although Bill was able to successfully gain the attention of the FTC, which uh, led to Herbalife paying a $200 million fine and was forced to reform some of its business practices. In 2018, he threw in the towel on the short position for a loss of approximately $1 billion. And, you know, I could also elaborate a little further on Herbalife in that Carl Icahn uh, tried to short squeeze Bill uh, or Ackman's position on Herbalife, uh, leading them to have their famous exchange on CNBC where both of them slandered each other live on air. And if you actually just you know, YouTube that, uh, you can rewatch it. Uh, it is, uh, it's entertaining nonetheless. Um, the other one that was a, you know, his biggest loss was Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and this is Quebec based Valiant Pharmaceuticals, uh, where he lost $4 billion. And he notes on the podcast with Lex that he had avoided pharmaceutical companies generally due to their complexity, but decided to make his first passive investment in 2015 because another activist investor was governing Valiant's board. Obviously, they weren't doing a very good job. Uh, however, uh, the company ended up making a series of decisions that were disastrous, including drug pricing investigations and improper accounting allegations, which led the company to be subpoenaed by U.S. prosecutors. A bill ended up actually doubling down on his investment, uh, backing the company. Uh, but in March of 2017, he sold his final stake in Valiant. And just, you know, you can see the destruction in capital there from, you know, 2015 to 2017. 
uh, that I have up on the screen here. So just to finish things off here, just quickly looking at some of Pershing's other current holdings. Uh, Bill has voiced that one of his most successful industries to invest in has been the food and beverage industry. Uh, he currently holds a position in restaurant brands, International or QSR on the TSX, as well as Chipotle, which is CMG on the New York Stock Exchange. And he says the reason for his success in the space has been due to finding restaurant businesses that have good systems or ones that he can implement systems so that he can create efficiencies and replicate for, you know, future growth. And for example, I was talking to the guys about this the other day, you know, we could really relate this to the Boyd group as one of the reasons that the Boyd group was so successful in growing its stock price from around $2 to above $300 today is because of the implementation of systems. You know, Boyd was acquiring mom and pop auto collision shops and introducing Boyd's systems into the businesses to create efficiencies, which gave them obviously a really long runway of growth. Now, another name which uh, Bill owns in the portfolio is Alphabet or Google or G-O-O-G-L on the NASDAQ, uh, which he began to invest in 2023 when people's concerns were misplaced over the company's AI positioning. So what he says is with the, with the introduction of ChatGPT, the market decided that Alphabet was falling behind in AI when in fact, Google has led the world as the dominant AI player up until this point, or I said Google, I mean Alphabet. And according to Bill, Alphabet likely held back on introducing its own chat GPT to the market due to the potential scrutiny that, you know, regulators would place on Alphabet being such a, you know, uh, powerhouse, a global powerhouse. Um, but, you know, given open AI was a startup, they received much less scrutiny. And as such, uh, given the sell-off and its valuation, Bill declares that it is one of the most attractive of the magne of the Magnificent Seven at this time. Now, to kind of bring things full circle here, I will leave you with one quote from uh, Bill. Uh, and you know, to bring it full circle, this is in relations to uh, relation to Brett's kind of them thematic top-down investing segment. So Bill says. We try to find very robust, stable businesses, which are only very modestly levered. And as a result, we don't need to part or to think particularly top down. We don't need to think about exactly where interest rates are going to be for us to do well. Uh, so, you know, it's just kind of full or brings it full circle, just like the one YouTube comment that we were saying earlier, you know, generally you don't need to be looking specifically for themes. Obviously, it's not a bad thing if you are adding to your portfolio, but at the at the end of the day, you know, it's cash flow, runway for growth, good uh, balance sheet, good valuation um, in line with, you know, what we're looking for at Keystone. And that was a long drawn out segment. So uh, hopefully the guys are still with me. No, actually, I'm gonna, I actually no. found that extremely interesting, to be honest. I, yeah. And uh, way to tie it in at the end. It's like a Seinfeld yeah. episode. Yeah. Right. <laughs> From start to beginning. Yes. Usually I it's fall the asleep podcast. when Brent is talking. No, 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 I'm yeah. joking. But no, but actually I, I found that that it was long, but I was I was mm -hmm. engaged in that the whole time. Um I did yeah, find it, well it interesting. Done. So I, I watched segments of that podcast as well. And um, you know what? It it's it's funny, well, somewhat funny, but I remember, I mean, I was following the whole Valiant um story back when that was happening. Mm -hmm. Um yep. and also the Herbalife. And I remember mm -hmm. seeing an interview with Bill Ackman back then. Um because he was getting killed on his, his short with Herbalife. Oh. And he, he was talking about some story or something relating to that investment. And he started crying or, or getting very teary eyed on the air. And I just kind of thought that was, you know, a bit of a yep. joke. I mean, somebody crying on air about an investment or, you know, um, but it, in the podcast, when he was talking about that period of his life, so many things were going on. Like he, he, he got killed on Valiant. He was getting killed on Herbalife. That attracted a bunch of people that were basically trying to take over his company and displace yep. him there. He got divorced from his wife. So he said that at the time he was really envisioning a, I think that there was like some other lawsuits as well, but envisioning um, himself being completely broke with nothing. And uh, so I obviously had no idea that all those things were going on in his life, but it made a lot more sense that he got, uh, he was a little sensitive. So I can kind of understand it now, but no, I mean, I, I think that his his investing methodology, it, it sounded very reasonable. It's not that different than ours. Um, one other thing that he said about the 
the on, on the podcast as well is that he does they don't short stocks anymore. Yeah. Right. Like they he he tried to get fancy with Herbalife and he's like, you know, we don't we don't we learned our yeah. lesson there. We didn't we don't short. It's it's funny. Like he talks about businesses with modest leverage now and and have you know, he probably prefers net cash or yeah. uh he probably getting burned on Valiant because it was a leverage story. It levered yeah. up over time yeah. and, and you know, and then doubling down and getting hurt even further. I mean, there were a few other analysts, uh, Canadian analysts who were pounding the table for Valiant. There were two um, companies. You know, I think one other was, it might even have been a spinoff of, of Valiant, but it was also a similar model. And they yeah. were just, you know, we were following the story close back then because they were so widely touted. Um, just, yeah. you know, they were so loved, be loved by so many analysts and portfolio managers, but the value. It always had so much debt though. Sense. It always just, you know, well, and it levered up the debt yeah. over time. It just kept, and that, that, cause it was buying not necessarily products with any growth at all. Um, you know, some of them had small percentage growth, but it was buying those and just, it had to keep buying them to grow at the rates it was buying. And then it had to keep levering up the balance sheet. It is a bit of a house of cards. And they got caught up in the controversy on raising drug prices. Cause I think that yeah. was a big part of their model was buying drugs, not doing, they weren't doing the R and D they were just buying mm -hmm. patents yeah. and then increasing the price. It doesn't leave the greatest taste. And in... yeah, I know it, it's yeah. uh, they were in front of Congress and, and everything. So. Yeah. But either way, I just thought that it was a really good interview. If people are interested, yep. they should listen to it. Um, you know, it, I've it seen really several segments of that interview. I thought there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot of good, information. you know, and it taught me a lot of like interesting things as well, just like from like the management of a fund where, you know, the reputational, you know, risk that he took after Valiant and Herbalife to basically together where all of a sudden he has this run on funds or run on capital from his fund. And, you know, one of the companies that I pulled up, CP Rail, you know, he he mentioned that he wishes he would have never had to sell it, but that was one of the things that he needed liquidity to, you know, pay back investors. So that is something that he ended up having to sell. And, you know, just these, just seeing, you know, kind of the managing liquidity and how, you know, difficult of a game it can be for some of these funds, I thought was interesting. And one last thing, you know, just to go on what you were saying of how tough his life really was getting, I agree completely, you know, he ended up saying on the podcast that, you know, he was going through Valiant, he, you know, had all this reputational risk, people were pulling their money, all of it, like, tons of his stocks were going down, he was going through a divorce where his, you know, ex-wife's lawyer was thinking that his assets were three times the value than they actually were because, you know, he was losing money with Valiant and whatnot. And his new girlfriend had like a photo shoot or something with Brad Pitt, and he didn't he, he didn't hear and back from return her. Return his for, calls, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He didn't hear back from her like all day long, so he was like living in this play. Or yeah, was, and then there were, there was a bunch of um, Brad Pitt's new girlfriend all over the tabloid. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So maybe Aaron knows why he was crying now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes it makes sense now. Maybe I was a little yeah. too judgmental at this. So yeah, he was li living in this where he's you know going through this divorce. His funds basically on the verge of collapse, and he just lost his you know. But he's, but it's a comeback story because he got through it and he rebuilt exactly. it and he 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 retuned his methodology. Um, and I think he wrestled her back from Brad that. Pitt. So. Um, and you know, well, yeah, at the end of the day, we're in the business of, you know, making, you know, bets and some are going to be great and some aren't going to be great. You know, maybe there's another quote by Bill that says that, you know, and it's, it's true, you know, but at the end of the day, it's letting those winners ride. It's about limiting the bad and then holding on to the great exactly. companies too, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, that's another, to bring it full circle, that's another thing we'll be talking about in our upcoming live webinars that'll be uh, at the end of, what is it, early May? Is that what uh, we're doing, it right? Early be, May, you've got it there. Early April, early April. Early early April, geez, I went way farther. Early April, it's true. They're coming up soon, which is excellent. I think that's gonna end our show for this week. Um, again, we gave away one of these mugs. If you want one of them, beautiful cork bottoms <laughs> mugged. Then if you want to get mugged by Keystone, then uh, send your questions in to our Your Stock, Our Take segment. And uh, we, keep, we appreciate those every week and we'll endeavor to answer those. 
If you're watching this right now on YouTube, smash that subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, we'd love it if you rated and reviewed us. Always, as always, positive reviews is what we're looking for. Uh, Again, I'd like to wish you all profitable investing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.